you're not going to be able to pass Medicare for all with the way that our current political system is designed because you have progressive Democrats who are for it on the record, you know, like the the, the Bernie crew. And as you can tell, I'm for this. Mm-hmm. You have moderate Democrats who are for some version of it, maybe not really when push comes to shove. And what happened in California is the moderate Democrats spiked it. The moderate Democrats had, which is, by the way, the bulk of the legislators, the right. moderate Democrats, but they, there's a lot of corporate money. And they said, so if you're a healthcare provider, you're looking at this being like, well, by and large, I'm making a ton of money off of the the folks that have no choice but to pay, and I'm avoiding having to cover people that are okay. struggling, mm-hmm. who are, by the way, going to be more costly for me and can't pay, so that's a drag. So let me just uh, avoid that entire population. So right. they so they managed to spike it. Now, the, what happened in California would happen nationally. And so if you are a progressive who wants universal health care, your first vision is like maybe we'll just take control of the Democratic Party and Democrats will pass it. Uh, and you have to look and say, like, California, two-thirds of the legislature is Democrats. They got they, all the They Dems. did not pass it. Mm-hmm. So with that as your backdrop, uh, I'm going to suggest that the only way that we're going to get something like universal health care passed is if you don't have this two-party system where both parties are essentially locked up by corporate money. The two-party system will never pass Medicare for all. And all you have to do is look at California and say, two-thirds Democratic majority, governor who ran on it. By the way, completely silent on this bill. Backtrack now, yeah. Well, he didn't backtrack officially, but he just said, let this bill die without my expending political capital. So what happened in California would happen in the U.S. time and time again. If you want... Medicare for all or universal health care, some version of that in the United States of America, you want democracy reform. You want to move off of the duopoly. The duopoly will never pass anything like that. This week on Forward, the battle for the soul of the Republican Party. Medicare for all dies in California and the importance of dads and male role models. This week on Forward. And we're back. Uh, What is going on with the Republican Party They voted to censure Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney for serving on the January 6th commission. And then Mitt Romney came out and was like, hey, this is really the opposite of what you want. Like these people are are courageous, standing on principle. Uh, Censuring them is a terrible look. So we all appreciated Mitt trying to stand up for his fellow sane Republicans, frankly. And uh, it's a really terrible sign of where the Republican Party is, where uh, January 6th was called, I believe it was like a legitimate means of political expression or something along those lines. All right. So I'm going to need you to treat me like I know nothing on this because I've been down a boys and men crisis rabbit hole the past week and a half. Uh, So I followed this a little bit, but so let's start with basics. What does it mean to censure? Like, what is that? I saw that. I hadn't heard that term in politics maybe in a while. Censure is you formally reprimand someone. You say, you're bad. We don't like you. Just in writing, slap on the wrist? Yeah, it, it's somewhere between a slap on the wrist and like a scarlet letter, where at least in theory, it would be sending a very big signal to Republican voters that, look, these people are not for you. They're technically like not part of the party. Is that not? I don't know if technically. You're not excommunicated from the party. Okay. You're still part of the party, but we don't like you. And do they vote on that? Like, where does that come from? They do vote on that. So the party voted to censure Liz Cheney. And what's the other guy's name? Adam Kinzinger. Adam Kinzinger. Where's he from? Illinois. Illinois. I don't mean to quiz you. I literally just... um, It's fine. I'm going to play the everyman on this. Um, And she's from... Liz is in Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah. So they get the boot because they said that the January 6th protests, let's call it, was and, not legitimate political discourse, which is what the line was from the RNC chair. Right? Well, they're serving on a committee to investigate and figure out what the heck happened and who should be held responsible. And they booted her off. So Ronna McDaniel, this is the quote from RNC chair. 
Ms. McDaniel said, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger crossed a line. They chose to join Nancy Pelosi in a Democrat-led persecution of ordinary citizens who engaged in legitimate political discourse that had nothing to do with violence at the Capitol. Now, I think she was trying to differentiate between the the violent protest because there's a chunk of protesters that went in there and like ripped the Capitol to shreds and had their field day. And then there were people that came to protest were like, I'm out for this, I'm out. Um, but I don't think she's really taking the time to differentiate. This seems more like warfare than actually trying to have a nuanced conversation. Yeah, very, very much so. And and there's been a shift in the conversation over the last number of weeks where a lot of people are freaking out about whether our democracy is going uh, to make it through the next several years. Right. I'm certainly on that same wavelength. Uh, no, we had Stephen Marsh, the author of The Next Civil War, on, and he predicts very dark things over the next number of months. Uh, yes, he does. And I find his predictions to be very reasonable. So uh, I'm kind of happy to say that a lot of those predictions are now making it into journalists uh papers where mm -hmm. they are saying look guys we should be freaking out uh recently there was an op-ed asking democrats to vote for sane republicans um in places where they could conceivably do so because the struggle for the soul or you know the essence of the republican party is really where all the action is. And this is one of the reasons why I think polarization is so destructive is, is if you say to a Democrat, hey, look, there genuinely are some sane Republicans on the other side that if they win, then our democracy will continue to function, that they, they won't be uh, trying to right. invalidate election results or the rest of it. And then there are other people in the Republican Party that are full on stop the steal too, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Now, the, the problem with polarization is that if you're a Democrat, uh, and you're being asked to vote for a Republican, albeit the better one, uh, you really can't do it. You have a very, very hard time. You have to re-register. There, there are I, mechanical problems, but also there's like a massive tribal cultural problem. Like a moral problem. Sorry, you're not even talking about the mechanics. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> like, so most Democrats would not even consider doing right. what, what folks are starting to suggest and recommend. And there is this vanishingly small, unfortunately, tribe of Republicans that are standing up for what's right. Mm -hmm. I would put Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney there. I would put Peter Meyer there. I would put uh, David mm -hmm. McKinley Mitt. Uh, of West Virginia, Mitt Romney, uh, Lisa Murkowski, for mm -hmm. sure. Like the, these are principled public servants who, if, if they have the choice, I mean, some of them are taking uh, measures that put them in position to be censured in position to be um, voted out potentially. Like they're doing it because they know it's the right thing to do. Right. Um, and one of the frustrations I have is that there hasn't exactly been a rush of support to bolster the Peter Myers or the Adam Kinzingers uh, of the world. Because if you're a Democrat, it's like, what am I gonna do, bolster a sane Republican? That's mm -hmm. not my jam. Yep. I think that this is where all of the action should be, mm -hmm. is uh, one big example, Lisa Murkowski in Alaska. Yep. There is so much riding on her election in uh, the fall, mm -hmm. where Alaska is the first state to do away with closed party primaries. So it's uh, an uh, open primary, nonpartisan. You can vote for anybody. Yep. Um, and then it goes to a ranked choice voting. And Joe Manchin, who I know some people hate Joe Manchin, but Joe Manchin uh, said he's going to be endorsing Lisa Murkowski in her Senate race. So this is a Democrat a nominal Democrat endorsing a Republican. Uh, and the question is how many Democrats are going to catch on that what happens to the Lisa Murkowski's and the Liz Cheney's of the world is actually uh, existential, in my opinion. So a couple thoughts. First one is this. What does the censure or the censuring of these, let's call it sane Republicans left, what does that mean to the average human? Does it mean that, um, are they getting picked off one by one by their own? It means that the Republican Party has lost its way uh, officially. Yeah. Where someone who stands up and says, look, we should investigate what happened on January 6th, then it's like you're um, in the wrong. Got it. And it's all Donald's party, if you will. Yeah. Or various versions of that and Marjorie Taylor Greene, et cetera. Now, not to say the Democrats are... But I, I can't tell you how many times on social media I'll see something being like Republicans are X, where it's like just people uh, on the Democratic side just can't stand all Republicans. 
Um, even Republicans that I think are some of the more principled sane ones, they'll, they'll you know, t take violent issue with the fact that uh, Lisa Murkowski didn't vote for um, a particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I've met Senator Murkowski. Mm -hmm. She struck me as like a very, very uh, reasonable human. Right. Uh, you know, and, and so that there's like a real lost opportunity, shall we say. Like, like that, that Joe Manchin is trying to demonstrate what can happen if, and again, a lot of Democrats, uh, you know, aren't keen right. on Joe Manchin right now. But Joe Manchin's leaning off uh, across and saying, look, we need Lisa Murkowski to win. And I completely agree. Right. So I feel like this has been shifting for a while and it's starting to come to a head. And it, elections, like election years usually cause that. But we've talked about kind of four parties in the United States right now, the far left, far right, and then your moderate left and moderate right. Um, but I feel like there's really almost, I'm going to say three right now. I'm curious your thoughts when the fourth is maybe shaping. But you have the far left and the far right. We know what those are. And then you now have this pro-civilization. It's not a party yet, but some sort of lane emerging where it's Liz Cheney and Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, I guess. Like you could argue there's this sort of, it's like all moderates. And it's maybe you could argue corporate Democrat or corporate Republican. There's some sort of you know, if you're pro-establishment or pro-institution, it, it kind of leans a little corporate, you know? Um, do you, and then maybe you could argue there's like this rebel independent thinker like a Kristen Cinema, who's maybe um, like a wild card in that sense. But is, do you see this shaping up? What are your, um, are there new lanes being created here? There is an opportunity for a new lane to be created. Uh, I said to someone the other day, imagine if we were to raise a $300 million fund and then go to senators, Manchin, Cinema, Murkowski, uh, Susan Collins, um, and say, your party is turning on you. Mm -hmm. um, if you join this new party, we will have a super PAC that will bankroll your next election at the same level that you currently have. So we'll buy you out of your contract with your party, mm -hmm. more or less, <laughs> for, for, for the next. Yeah, big super PAC, though. Okay. The, the next election. You need a very, very big super PAC. Um, could you get four senators, two senators, three senators to bite? Maybe, especially if they're at a point where if they have to go through their own party, they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my, might as well... Uh, take a shot on the third way. Uh, so th this is a trial balloon idea that, uh, you know, like p people have been vastly entertained by um, when, when it's been suggested to them. You could do the same with um, representatives too. Right. Uh, the the numbers would be lower because obviously they don't have to run as um, big campaigns. Right. Um, but you would need a much bigger number of them because the swing, the Senate right now is 50-50. So if you had you know, two to four senators, you genuinely could you be could the full swing government the whole control just about everything. Whereas Congress, there might be a gap of, you know, 10 seats or something like that. These wild cards are complicated, though, because if you had another Joe Manchin, you just have no idea. You know, like there's he's, he's issue by issue, which I generally like, except when you're trying to get something done. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, you know, like so like I, I have my own perspective. on Like, I, I think we should get rid of the filibuster. I, I think, mm -hmm. um, for yeah. example, cinema's in the wrong, like saying that, it you know, the filibuster is enshrined. Seems like, like a hot mess. Yeah. Uh, but to your point, is there this um, pro-democracy Republican group? Mm -hmm. um, like Mitt Romney that could be brought in to collaborate, which they're working on this Electoral Account Reform Act right now. Right. Yeah, that, that to me, again, is the crucial pivot group. It's that if you get enough of the sane Republicans, and a lot of Democrats listening to this would be like, there are no sane Republicans. And, yeah. and I, I will say to you, if that is true, then we're in deep shit because, yes. uh, you know, like things are trending. They're going to roll in 20 in the fall. There, I mean, right now it's mid-February. Uh, a lot can happen, to be fair. Nine months. Mm -hmm. A lot a lot could happen. Um, so the economy has picked up significantly by the numbers where everyone was shocked at how robust the job numbers were and everything else. One of the things that has made me skeptical that that's actually going to become some Biden bounce mm -hmm. is that people are pissed off regardless. It's like if you were to say to folks, hey – Jobs are plentiful. You should be happy. No one's happy right now. No one's happy because of uh, Omicron, because of 
it's the winter because of inflation. Like everyone's pissed off. Mm -hmm. It's very, very hard to talk someone into feeling good about the economic picture right now. Um, could that change in nine months? It's possible. But no, it, it, it's a tough bet. The Dems have a messenger problem. And we've talked about this before where no real clear vision and that vision doesn't, you know, the Republicans didn't, I wouldn't call it a vision from a business standpoint, but they were, but Donald Trump in 2016, his vision of make America great again and drain the swamp got him to lower taxes and do some like, mess with Obamacare rules. And, you know what I'm saying? It got them to be, and feeling like you got wins. The price we paid to beat Donald Trump in 2020 was that we all rallied behind objectively a weak messenger because it was plain vanilla. It was, we can all stomach this to defeat this evil that is Donald Trump is what most people were voting for. And now we're paying the consequences. And I think, actually, this is the question I wanted to ask you. Would you have endorsed Biden and lined up this way if you knew that Trump was gonna run again? You know what I'm saying? Like, I think what the big problem here is we knew we know Trump is still waiting in the wings. And it wasn't if you beat him the first time he was dead. Right. There was an assumption that if we got him out, he'd be embarrassed or a loser no, he'd have for the brand. In 2020, the job was to get Trump out of the Oval Office. Yeah. And Joe did win. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite likely that someone else would not have won. Mm -hmm. uh, so Joe did the job. Yep. Uh, you're right that uh, he had something of a brief honeymoon. Um, and he's not projecting a ton of energy. Yeah. Uh, it, it is incredible how it just comes down to the one human. I mean, I've been in the room, you've been in the room with virtually everyone who ran in the Democratic field. And so you, you do kind of get a sense as to the uh, aura or mm -hmm. um, presence. The vibe, the energy. The, the vibe, leader, the, the energy. Yes. You know, that there are some people where they really do give off a particular vitality. Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty wild. Um, and, you know, we, we all know that Joe performed better in states that just didn't see him that much in person. Mm -hmm. uh, his worst states were the first states where they saw right. him the most. Right. Um, it's kind of what I, my, where my head was. It's the price we paid. And look, the Republicans you know, in their eyes, did a great job of making the, the election and the loss not feel legitimate to them, right? So keep their their guy in good standing. Um, but that has hurt us in that we don't have a direction as a party and we all know what Trump stands for and we know he's waiting in the wings. Um, and that's scaring a lot of people and a lot of folks are going to stay home this time around or flip to the other side. It's not great and it's what the party is big time struggling with right now. If you know me, you know that I think that your data should be yours and not the big tech companies who just hoover it on up and they take and they take. And what do you get back in return? Uh, agitation <laughs> in, in many questions. But they also are selling your data uh, and profiteering. Uh, and that's not the way you should be surfing the web or using the internet. I recommend using a virtual private network, and the VPN we recommend here at Forward is ExpressVPN. It's the number one rated VPN provider. Huge firms use it. I use it. You should use it. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang to get three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash yang to learn more. You'll be glad you did. You can just surf anonymously know that the tech companies can't keep track of you what is peace of mind worth uh you know it'll just make you sleep easier surf easier and know that no one's keeping track of you because you're beaming in through some server in some far off place that is completely anonymous expressvpn.com You've said this a number of times that politics is a horseshoe where the the extremes start to touch, yeah. right? And 
And then I had known growing up, like Democrat meant something different in the 70s than it did in the 90s. Um, uh, like a Kennedy Democrat was different than, uh, you know, a, a Bill Clinton Democrat, if you will. And th these things start to morph. And I think we're seeing a uh, morphing right now. And the one to me that is, I'm, I haven't asked you about this, but I'm curious, um, what your thoughts on Democrats losing ground on and Republicans becoming the party of free speech? Because um, right now you have major Democratic organizations, let's call it ACLU and the NPR, big time against um, curriculum transparency, which is the concept of anything you give your kids, you have to put available to like online through or through the state government. Um, the ACL, ACLU said curriculum transparency are just thinly, thinly veiled attempts at chilling teachers and students from learning and talking about race in schools. You've got talks about banning books, things like that. Democrats used to be all about put the crazy books in schools. They used to be all about freedom of speech and had that moral high ground. Thoughts on this? Have we, we I don't think we've talked about this. We have not, and it is interesting. It, it's, so if you look at the existential threats to the, to the country, armed violence uh, is a million times more likely to car, come from the alt-right, from people who question whether the government is legitimate or whether its rules should apply. But there is this, this zeal around uh, cordoning off certain points of view mm. that, that is coming from the Democratic Party that is turning off a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it is an interesting flip. So you have many, many conservatives who are just reflexively like, look, no censorship, freedom of speech. Right. And they feel very, very bent out of shape about tech platforms uh, giving various conservatives the boot. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out that conservative content actually flourishes on many of these social media platforms. So, yeah. so, so it's a, a little bit, uh, you know, it's like a, a little bit uh, <laughs> strange, strange. But, well, they used to be the party of censorship, right? We can't teach our kids that, or that's terrible, right? And now, now, now the biggest flashpoint is obviously Joe Rogan, yeah, um, and that's all coming on Spotify. Mm -hmm. And the the last word is that Spotify is not giving Joe Rogan the boot. Um, no. They're going to put some COVID advisories. They've scrubbed some content. They've uh, committed to investing in um, other types of voices. Right. Uh, but there, there are so many people on the left that want to see Joe gone. Right. Um, and I, I think the White House actually came out or it, I don't think it was Joe, but I think it was uh, Jen Psaki came out and said that they hope Joe gets uh, scrubbed, which which I, I found it makes sense from their perspective, though, because of covid vaccine stuff. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's I, I think that, that is the rationale. Uh, but it, you're right that there, there's been like a, a bit of an inversion in terms of free speech and and this is something where conservatives have like have a ton of energy and i i think fairly broad agreement from a majority of americans my fear is um democrats they generally have the moral high ground they have the empathy card right where you need to focus on this community or that community, or think about the people. That has been like theoretically the ethos of the Democratic Party, whether Republicans are more about, yeah, we need to do what's best for like the, the greatest number, make the hard decisions, like not care about, put yourself up by the bootstraps, let capitalism, the system work like that. You know, when the Democrats had felt, no, this is the, at least the morally right um, thing to do, even if not in practice, the right well, piece. Well, you were some, you. Uh, retweeted an article about how a Democratic administration in Chicago was botching the rollout of universal basic income. Three months, nothing. No updates. It's nothing. the same with the uh, rental forgiveness stipends. Mm -hmm. So the the problem for the Democratic Party is they uh, they talk about bettering um, the common person, um, but then their systems aren't terribly efficient. Correct. And so people get really pissed off and fed up. And it feels hypocritical. I mean, yes. one thing that's going on right now that is going to be such a loser for Democrats is masking in schools. And at this point, the science uh, is, let's say, inconclusive as to whether masks are keeping people safer. One thing I can say fairly authoritatively as a parent, 
kids wearing masks affects the kids themselves and not in a way that you want. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the learning that goes on in a classroom would be responding to teachers or your peers. And a lot of the time you would use your face for those things. But you have generations of kids that are just looking at each other with masks on their eyes. And like, do you, do you think that those kids are going to be as expressive, as social? Talk about three uh, years of this. As, yeah, like, I mean, and, and so uh, Democrats being like mask, mask, mask. Um, and, you, and so there's a period during which you could be like, OK, you know, we don't know what's going on. Let, mask let, let's up, a couple of weeks, kids. guys, hunker down. And, and then after the too. science gets to a point where it's like, well, you know what? If you are a vulnerable adult and you put your mask on, that actually is all you need. The kid does not need to have a mask on necessarily. Right. Oh, and, oh, and by the way, the numbers show that the kids themselves, like, you know, not very vulnerable to serious illness. Right. And data is showing that having masks on is not great for kids' social development. Right. So that there, there are things that the Democrats talk about being for. Like if you were to say, hey, are Democrats pro-kids? I'm sure Democrats would be like, oh, saying. yeah, Take we're, we're like the most right. pro-kids. And it's like, then why are we doing some of these things that are objectively Correct. not very pro-kids? Why are we doing things that that don't let the resources flow through? Mm -hmm. to, like the Democrats are in many ways like about the bureaucracies themselves more than the results. And then if you go to them and say, hey, these results suck, then, then, then there's never like, a, oh, yeah, the results do suck. It's like, oh, you know, like, mm -hmm. let the professionals handle it. <laughs> and that, that's like my point is that the Dems are slowly but surely seeding the moral high ground here. And so, I mean, just this week, Stacey Abrams was photographed with her and in a classroom. She's not wearing a mask and all of the kids are, every single kid. And she put it out on her own platform as if, like, we're just not seeing the, like, the, she doesn't have to follow the rules that the kids do. It's like this blatant, it's now become like the bastion of the conservative, like anti-mask movement to see that. But it's not just that, it's Newsom and um, Garcetti at the um, the playoff game in LA, not wearing masks. And Garcetti literally claimed that he held his breath, breath when he took the mask off for a photo. It's these hypocrisies um, that are, are chipping away. And to me, if the Dems lose free speech, you know, which is one that is very core to a lot of Americans and has been proven to be better than the the alternatives globally. Um, that's bad news, in my opinion. That's what's well, good news for Republicans, I guess. But it's bad news if you are aligned with some of the things, at least in theory, of the Democratic Party. You know what I'm saying? Do you see where my head is going? I, I do. And uh, I think... I think the Democrats are heading for a loss in 22 and if nothing changes in 24. Right. And there are various excesses you would like to see them pull back on. Yeah. Um, now, the odds of them pulling back on that, vanishingly low. Yeah. Uh, so we have our work cut out for us. Um, what I've been saying to folks is that the Democrats are like more government, more government, more go government. And by the way, there are a lot of things I think people who know me know. I totally think the government should be doing much, much more in and investing much, much more in. Yep. So I'm not like anti-big government the way some people are. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Republicans who are like less government, less government, government, stupid, government, stupid. Um, and most of us are in this like we want the government to to be really, really good, even great at the things that they are supposed to do. Yes. And that is not happening, and we're getting more and more fed up. Mm -hmm. um, now, you and I, mainly me, somewhat you, have, <laughs> have undertaken this massive challenge to be like, hey, look, like there is a world yeah. where our government is able to deliver at these really high levels. Now, that's not the world we live in. Yeah. And, and I am going to share a story that, you know, I, like I don't know how this is going to grab people, um, but I went to Washington, D.C. last week, uh, I took the train. Um, I took the train back to New York and I popped up at Penn Station. It was 10 p.m. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll just go to the yellow cab line and, and get a taxi. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, there were no yellow cabs. It was a bunch of kind of sketchy people in like uh, non-liveried cabs. Oh, interesting. Um, so I said, eh, like, 10 p.m.? Uh, yeah. So On I said, a, like a Thursday? Yeah. Day of the week for this, yeah. So I said it was a Wednesday. And so I okay. said, well, I don't need to wait in this or I didn't I don't need to accept this non-liveried cabbie who seemed kind of sketchy the rest of it i probably should have gotten in but uh, i didn't um and so i just started walking and like my apartment is walkable from penn mm -hmm. um but wow were, was there a lot of human struggle yes. uh, on that walk mm -hmm. uh, and i've walked that equivalent dozens of times and i've never 
felt the way I felt unsafe this this past time where it was uh, it, it, it was like I actually said to myself, it's like, wow, like if you were to try and draw up like a dystopian environment, like what is the difference between that and what I'm seeing right now? Uh, there were so many people you know, struggling with uh, substance abuse, mental health issues, uh, you know, and that that area has always had some issues, mm -hmm. but the issues were never like right uh, like this. And so when, when you think about what the role of government, I mean, right now, I, I believe you're going to see. And there are folks who are just losing confidence in our government's ability to deliver various things. And and if you have the capacity, then maybe you shift gears. Uh, you know, maybe you head to the suburbs or whatever the heck. Um, or in, in some cases, just to another state entirely, like a low, low tax state. Um, so you see this real grappling with what government can and can't deliver yeah. and an increasingly inchoate conversation around it where what you should be saying is like, hey, how are things going? Like, can we see results? Like my walk that night, I mean, like I, you know, can't forget about it. I mean, I saw yeah. things even in like that walk where, 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 where it's like yeah. an impressing your head. But you don't see things like that played out in the media in, in a way. Like you're not showing like quality of life issues. Just people will make adjustments on their own. Can the Democrats recover from this in the sense? So right now you're seeing, so Biden did a sort of a town hall with Eric Adams on, on crime. You're seeing governors around particularly in mayors in Chicago and L.A., backtrack. I am their so glad movements that some of the, the Democrats in some of these cities uh, have come around to the fact, OK, crime's the problem, crime's yeah. the problem. Is it too little too late? I think it's going to be a massive challenge mm -hmm. for a lot of these cities to get it right. Yeah, it's, but it's always a challenge, by the way. It would be a challenge hard. at any time, good or yeah. bad. But at, at this point, it's a little bit like toothpaste that's come out of the tube. Yeah. You know, it's like going to be tough to get that toothpaste back in. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, you're out, dude. Um, I, you know, it's, it's it, my, my sense is that the Democrats um, have governments and media institutions typically on their side. And both of those are declining. Both of those are breaking in front of our eyes. And that, to me, is advantage anti-establishment and advantage Republicans right now. Something very, very interesting happened in California last week, which is they did not pass Medicare for all. Now, let, let me backtrack a little bit. Gavin Newsom ran for governor saying Medicare for all. Two-thirds Democratic supermajority uh, and there were a lot of progressives saying, let's do it, California. Let's lead the country. Let's show what we can do. Mm -hmm. And it did not come to a vote. And this was a Die. crushing. DOA. Yeah. Dead on arrival. It, it, means, it was yeah. a thing where the per, the legislator was pushing for it, said, look, if we make them vote for it, it's going to fail. Uh, and it's going to be harder to eventually do this, not easier. And then people got super mad that there wasn't a vote. And people thought, well, if we can't do this in California, where can we do this? Correct. And and I want people to to really reflect on the lesson of what this means. So California is easily the most progressive state, and they couldn't get Medicare for all passed. What does this mean nationally? Now, first, let me say very much on the record, I am for universal health care. You know, some version of it. It do, it does not make sense that we are maybe the only developed country that doesn't do something. Everyone else has this right. Not everybody. Most of our peers have this right. And it's the ridiculous. argument I made for this during the campaign was our current system is terrible for business. <laughs> terrible for business. And it's people. terrible for jobs. It's terrible for people and families. Uh, right now, if, if I employ someone, of course I want to say you're a contractor or a temp employee because I don't want to pay for your health care. Because if I do pay for health care, it is so expensive. It's $800 a month, pretty much minimum, by the way. If you're an employer, that's what it costs you. And that, that yeah, adds up. Yeah, that, yeah that, I mean, that's 10 Gs, but but a lot of places, it's going to be a bit higher than that. A, a lot of, that's, that's like the And, the, and the reason run. why I know it's going to go higher and higher is because the healthcare industry just grows and grows. It's up to <laughs> 16, 17, 18% of GDP. Yeah. Um, so it's really bad for business. It's bad for the country. You have to get the costs under control. Uh, and there's a very, very pro-economy, pro-business uh, version of this case that can be made. So I am for universal health care in the United States of America. The thing that uh, people, in, in my view, have to absorb from this lesson of what happened in California uh, is that you're not going to be able to pass Medicare for all 
with the way that our current political system is designed because you have progressive Democrats who are for it on the record, you know, like the, the, the Bernie um, crew. And as you can tell, I'm for this. Mm -hmm. You have moderate Democrats who are for some version of it, maybe not really when push comes to shove. And what happened in California is the moderate Democrats spiked it. The moderate Democrats had, which is, by the way, the bulk of the legislators, the right. moderate Democrats, but they, there's a lot of corporate money. And they said, so if you're a healthcare provider, you're looking at this being like, well, by and large, I'm making a ton of money off of the the folks that have no choice but to pay, and I'm avoiding having to cover people that are okay. struggling, mm -hmm. who are by the way going to be more costly for me and can't pay, so that's a drag. So let me just uh, avoid that entire population. So right. they so they managed to spike it. Now what happened in California would happen nationally, and so if you are a progressive who wants universal health care. Your first vision is like maybe we'll just take control of the Democratic Party and the Democrats will pass it. Uh, and you have to look and say like California, two-thirds of the legislature is Democrats. They got all the They did not pass it. Mm -hmm. So with that as your backdrop, uh, I'm going to suggest that the only way that we're going to get something like universal health care passed is if you don't have this two-party system where both parties are essentially locked up by corporate money. This is your forward party argument for Medicare or for th All. This is just, look, the two-party system will never pass Medicare for All. And all you have to do is look at California and say, two-thirds Democratic majority, governor who ran on it, by yeah. the way, completely silent backtrack on this bill. now, yeah. Well, he didn't backtrack officially, but he just said, let this bill die without my expending right. political capital. So what happened in California would happen in the U.S. time and time again. If you want... Medicare for all or universal health care, some version of that in the United States of America, you want democracy reform. You want to move off of the duopoly. The duopoly will never pass anything like that. Uh, at least uh, I never, it's a long time, um, will not pass anything like that in the foreseeable future. Right. Never a long time. G given like the, the way the mechanics are set up. So I, I like I, I want people to take like the, the stiff lesson from California that one should, if you have this goal, which by the way, I completely share. You know, it, it, it's mm -hmm. in both of my last two books, I was like, we should have universal healthcare. Yep. People consider me like a centrist or whatever. Like I just want things to be better. But the current system will not give the American people something significant and transformative like Medicare for all. I, I will also say that um, to the extent that there was an opportunity, it was when Obamacare was passed and then it, it got it. kind of uh, brought back. So you're for the public option though, right? Not true eliminating private insurance or you would eliminate private insurance over time um, or keep it for the very rich or what? Um, Whatever we have to do. I mean, okay. you know, it's like I'm, you know, like there, there are certainly versions of the plan I'm more excited about, um, but uh, like uh, I think having a public option that then um, outcompetes over time. I mean that that, yeah. that makes sense. You wouldn't want to. That's what most other countries are doing, right? There's, yeah, and you wouldn't want to take an entire giant, well developed, eighteen uh, percent of your GDP. And yeah, and just be like, yeah, like gonna you know just gonna scrub it all it. because uh, like at this point, uh, you know there 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 are there's like a meaningful transition to be made. So does this get spiked because people are not for government running their health care, given that they're not for government. And I mean, people like it's called moderate Democrats, right? Or does it get spiked because most people actually like there's a, there's still a healthy number of people that don't mind their health care. The read in California. So you're, you're yeah. talking about it, Zach, as if like the people of California came together and said, we don't want this. So it's legislatures. In it, it was just that uh, a number of legislators were like, you know, not going to do it. I, I have a sense that the majority of Californian voters were for it. And, and so they spiked it because. Bad for business. Bad for business because their donors, they're getting money from. Yep. So you're I mean, saying again, gotta, the governor it's a system problem and the, not the well, the governor ran problem. on it. You yeah. know, it's like it's it's not like the voters were like, oh no, we don't want this. All of a sudden, it was just like it just ran aground of uh, of a system that won't. And we just shrug now because I didn't see this in the news besides that one political art Politico article. Maybe there are a couple other headlines. You know what I'm saying? It, this, you'd think this be national news. You have Bernie Sanders an entire presidential campaign in two cycles. Second well, place. So, so this is this is the disease this. right now, is that the media will segment po political figures and voters into ideological lanes. Mm -hmm. Like progressives are for Medicare for all, and yep. then you know other people are not. Like the the fact is, 
like, you know, you could talk to a host of like reasonable conservatives who would be into some version of it, like Romney care ish. Yep. Um, because it's sensible. It's good for business. Yeah. All you know, the, the healthcare yeah. industry is just, you know, like overrunning everything. Yeah. And we're not getting results. drug prices. It's most one of the most popular yes. policies in there out so, there. Too so, high. so so it's the the being separated into ideological lanes plus the two party system that will keep anything meaningful from happening. Takeaway here is if they can't get it done in California, they're not getting it done. It's not happening. Yes. Unless you change something up. And that's the dark reality we're in and why you did well, why you started the forward party. That's it. Right. Yeah, the current system will not deliver. We need to upgrade the system itself. If enough of us got together to make meaningful to make it happen, we could. You know, there's nothing stopping us. In a way, we need to tout this more because you know what? It's lo- it's not ambiguous anymore. Like it's always been. You probably had enough proof, but right now you're like today, 2022. Like, <laughs> you know how many people are in favor of this? The most liberal state in the country can't get it done. Yeah, we really not should be being more because right now, if you ask Democrats, hey, why can't you get anything done? The answer will be Republicans. Yes. In, in California, there, are there were no Republicans, Republicans to, to, you know. <laughs> yes, the there's no way to blame but the party. Yes. yes. And that was my problem with what's going on in Chicago with the universal basic income pilot. It's like, there's no Republicans stopping this. It's just Democratic bureaucracies doing nothing with that money in the middle of the pandemic. Infuriating. And if, I don't know, would, Republic, would Republicans do better? Probably not. Um it's Republicans might problem. cut taxes, et cetera, et cetera. They would do a couple of things yeah. <laughs> that uh, are easier to sell, <laughs> more normal for Americans. Yeah. What, what we need is effective, efficient government actually delivering. And you need better political parties to do it. It's the winter time, it's kind of gray out there. Unless you are a very bizarre soul, you might be feeling a little bit down. And sometimes when you're down, you know it's gonna pass, but sometimes you should really talk to someone. And I don't mean that friend that just grunts at you. I mean someone who actually is professional and trained and can dig into whatever depression or stress or relationship issues you are having. And that's why I am so proud to be sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is helping millions of people take charge of their mental health by connecting them, you, to a professional mental health resource, therapist, someone who actually can dig into your issues and get you feeling better about your life. Hence the name BetterHelp. I want you to be healthy, vibrant, enjoying all of the things that you should be appreciating. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash yang. Join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash yang. You'll be glad you did. Get some help. I wrote an op-ed that should be out by now around uh, the problems you and I have been discussing for the last several weeks. Around, this is my rabbit hole, man. Around boys and men. So tell me about what you found out in the rabbit hole. And we could probably do multiple episodes on this, but role models and their impact on boys and girls, specifically dads, because I alluded to this last episode, but, and I think you may have said this in your op-ed, I can't remember because we went back and forth a number of versions, but the number one factor in violent crime and then individuals who commit violent crime, the strongest correlation, that correlation is not causation, but the strongest correlation by by far, it's not income, it's not race, it's not ethnicity, it's not socioeconomic status, it's whether or not they had a father. And there's something, I'm like, (laughs) my head's like, there's something in the water. Like there's something here where Boys without a father, without a male role model. And it can be replaced, like the, like we're talking about at scale, right? So it's usually a father, but, but it ends up being lack of a consistent male role model end up disintegrating. And that's like, you could point to that generally as the cause. Like that's what's crazy to me. And we've had this data for a while. And what we seem to blame everything else besides that. I don't know if you, you saw that in your research too, or, or what you think. Oh, yeah, I completely agree and see it. You have some data points that are staggering. 
Do you read? I'm gonna read these off for the crew here. Please do. Um, okay. My source here is The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell, who's going to be a guest on the show soon. Um, and so, but they are well sourced with a number of resources. But I'm just going to I'm going to rattle off like high level what we're looking at. If you have a father that's involved, um, f- uh, you are going to see higher school achievement, better grades, better verbal and math intelligence, less dropouts. Seventy one percent of high school dropouts have no father. Wow. Ninety percent of homeless youths and runaways are fatherless. If you do not have a father, you are substantially more likely to be a victim of abuse. So that's child abuse, major violence, sexual assault, domestic violence. Um, A 1% increase in fatherlessness in a neighborhood predicts a 3% increase in adolescent violence. 80% of rapists come from fatherless homes. If you have no father, you are four times more likely to end up considerably poorer in your gen when you are become an adult. But if it's the opposite, if you have a mother and a father, you have an 80% chance to move up if you have a mom and a dad. It is a predictor. Having a father is a predictive profile of being a bully and being bullied because you'll have poor self-esteem, poor grades, and poor social skills by the numbers. Your trust and empathy increase if you have a father. And no dad is the greatest correlating factor of suicide rates amongst teenagers. Now, the other crazy ones, they're just fun. I, I didn't listen. As a, as a dad, this is making me feel very, very... Uh, important. Yes, you are massively important. You're, I'm arguing, you, I mean, look, moms are very, very important as well. But the downside risk of no mother is not as bad as the downside risk of no father, um, particularly well, for boys. Well, I, I would actually say that the mother is more likely to be present. And then the question <laughs> That's is, a good, yeah. yeah, and then the question actually is have whether that downside risk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so single dads, uh, I believe, comprise something like 12 to 15 percent of mm-hmm. single parents. So maybe 85 percent are single moms. Um, yep. So, you know, so there are heroic single dads out there doing incredible things. Yep. And th- look, no moms number are bad, too. Those are like they're not single parents are like that is a big factor. Um but it, the numbers are worse for no dads. And here's the two crazy ones, and I'll stop. So boys without fathers have shorter, I'm going to s- probably butcher the name of this, is telomere is a name of a the end of a cro- chromosome, the end of your DNA chromosomes. So it's basically how we, it has, to, like every time a cell divides, that little end becomes a little shorter. And so in boys without dads, that is 40% shorter. Um they're for, oh, the, sorry, the loss is 40% greater, if you will. It's the same than um, uh, in boys and girls when they don't have a father. So if you don't have a father, like fatherless boys are literally living not as long wow. compared to girls. Like, the, the, Well, this is the, the connection with, with that chromosome. Um, and then the other one, and that's what I'm saying. These are the ones that like, seem crazy to me, but there is data on it. Every single member of ISIS was fatherless. Essentially, every single member of ISIS was fatherless. You mean... The, like Americanized ISIS? Or? No, like over in the Middle East. It's a global problem. Wow. Yeah. Now, there's an argument that it's most of them. America killed most of the fathers and mainly the sons were the ones avenging their deaths and, um, and fighting America. But it was attracting boys without fathers. And you could go back in history like Hitler for youth. And today, neo-Nazis typically tend to attract um, boys without fathers. So anyway, this is the rabbit hole I've been down. I don't have conclusions yet. Um, I want to read more. But that last part was very, very dark. And it's something that Arthur Brooks said uh, on yeah. the podcast about his book, From Strength to Strength. He said that humans are very worshipful and we look for things to follow and elevate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you're a boy without a father, you're kind of looking for something to follow, uh, to give yourself structure, purpose, fulfillment, identity, right. community. And so if you have toxic ideologies, they're going to flourish much more in environments where people don't have dads. And and this is something that I, I would, would suggest, and this is going to be a, a massive theme for us. So we write this op-ed. I put out a tweet a while ago that has kicked off sort of this mail yeah. uh, um, series and of discussion. By the discussion. way, shout out to all of our new listeners who are tuned in for this um, because we have grown. Um, we always are kind of growing steadily, but we've grown um, a lot more because of this topic. So thank you all for for both listening and helping us feel validated that this is a big concern. So this is fact-based how we can help 
families, individuals, societies like uh, do, mm-hmm. do better. Um, you put out a tweet. I put out a tweet about failing boys and men, and it becomes politicized in a particular way, which makes zero sense because it's just you know just health. Just you want things to to go well. So this is something where uh, Republicans have had these conservative. Uh, family values. Now, uh, like, do I think a lot of that is, you know, frankly, not actually being served by the policies they advocate? Yes. I mean, if your family values, you'd probably be trying to get UBI uh, would be get a, people health care and the child tax grant, like all this other stuff, like that. That that to me. Right. Um, but uh, there there is this sense that a two parent home is better for the kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you were to say something like a two parent home is better for the kid in democratic circles. A lot of people will get upset at you, even though that's like a very strong factual statement. They would say, what do you have against single mothers or what's wrong with the kids? With you know, or, or I don't know. They'd probably give you a whataboutism. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, and by then, the way, most single moms would say, I'd love to have some help. Yeah. Right. Because I mean, there, there's something uh, uh, around um, poo-pooing the traditional family unit as kind of mm-hmm. yesteryear mm-hmm. and saying like, you know, now we should be having all of these like very unconventional um, arrangements. Sure. Or um, maybe it's heteronormative to say two-parent household because, uh, you know, like, though obviously, you know, gay and lesbian couples can have kids too. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of data on like, it's it's a two-parent piece. It's just yeah, it doesn't matter doubling the, gender the resources is. to the yeah. child is what you're talking about. Um, but then there's a male role model piece as well, um, particularly for boys. Um, and so what what they were what the um, book was saying is that today's so I want to talk about this and then I want to ask you a couple questions. But was that in today's society, women um, their opportunities have expanded, right? Not only were they used to you know the traditional model was women stay home and take take care of the in kids. The home. Now they can, they have the opportunity to both, you know, and like there's still a ton of problems with women in the workplace, but it's a lot better than it was, right? You have a lot more women working and getting college. So well, they're not just relying upon men for. Correct. They're not relying on, upon men in general, right? Prospects, um, yeah. Um, at least as much, anywhere near as much as they were. Now, men, it's been actually the opposite where they used to only have the work piece. They weren't taking care of kids. And you're not seeing as much men be dads. I mean, more for sure, but nowhere near as at the same scale as women getting into the workplace. And then how men used to find their purpose is going away. The big two that Warren talks about were one was being the warrior, which is literally going to war and being the hero, um, which we don't have as many wars. And so they're not we're not coming back a hero and that's not encouraged the way it was. Um, So that's gone. And then working with your hands, which has now been subject to automation, outsourcing, things like that. So you're working in a factory or the coal mine or. Uh, those types of jobs. So if those have gone away, you see men with that disappearing purpose in many ways. Um, and what they're filling the void with is uh, destructive, you know? Um, so anyway, this is my rabbit hole. Um, I talked to my dad about it and he said, this is not a rabbit hole, son. This is the truth. This is like, this is deep. Um, this is not just a rabbit hole, man. But my question, I guess the question um, thought for you, man, is like you have you have not succumbed to a lot of these kind of male tendencies that are driving a lot of society's destruction. Right. Like what was knock on wood? Thank you. Knock on wood, brother. What was I never asked you what how what was your relationship with your dad growing up? And did he do anything exceptional out of the ordinary to to focus on this? My dad was an immigrant to this country and he was a surly physicist who um, was very work-centered. Uh, he would come home and just ignore us. He had, he had, I mean, he had a couple of weird pursuits that he, he like liked. What? Like he started learning Japanese for no particular reason. Okay. Um, he, he did play basketball with um, some Chinese dads. Was he tall? Like uh, you? No, he was not tall. Um, but he... he had like a reasonable hook shot that he would just like <laughs> launch out there. Okay. Um, 
he did watch sports, so that that's probably one reason why sports is a thing. What sports? Uh, he'd watch Notre Dame football on NBC for that some reason. That was a big deal. It was like yeah, one of the few broadcasts. Because he got his, his master's in physics at Notre Dame okay. before getting his doctorate at Berkeley. Yeah. Um, to the extent that I had a really good male role model companion was my older brother, mm. uh, who I felt so indebted to because anything he did, I did and, and picked up. Uh, and how many years older? He's two, two and a half years two, older. Yeah. So it was such a boon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was 14, he had a car. And so we'd yeah. like go around. So, you know, like I could do stuff. <laughs> um, he did tennis. So I played tennis. He did Taekwondo. So I did Taekwondo. Uh, what else did he do that I, I was your I dad got or your mom encouraging you to do tennis and Taekwondo and those types of things? Um, my mom, uh, encouraged us um just for college apps really it was yeah. like oh you got to be well-rounded <laughs> yep. you know it was like asian um now that my big contribution was i got into basketball a bit later um and then played all throughout my 20s and 30s you know every week on a game here in, in new york that was a that, that was like my favorite part of the week man and like whatever was going on that week and saturday morning comes and i'd go to that gym at baruch um and There'd be 15 guys there and we'd shoot the shit. What's funny is I played with some of those guys for 10, 12 years. No fucking clue, like, uh, what they did for a living. No, no. It's just a basketball thing. <laughs> it, it, it was just we'd That's show cool. up and we'd, we'd do our thing. Um, then there came a time in my 30s when everyone started dropping, like, flies where, like, one guy would hurt an ankle, one guy would mm -hmm. hurt a thumb. And then every time you're like, ooh, like, you know, no injury. That's a good week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I struggled a lot with my masculinity when I was younger because I'd skipped a grade. I was smaller and scrawnier. What grade did you skip? Uh, kindergarten. So it wasn't okay, that cool. so, but it was like, but then it's forever. It wasn't like. A, yeah, yeah, it was forever. So, you know, I was. Your whole uh, high school experience. I graduated forever. from high school when I was 17 as a result. So yeah. I was always kind of uh, behind. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine what that would mean for me athletically because I was the scrawny Asian kid who was also a year behind everyone. Yeah. Not um, great. So I would feel like. Uh, stick figure dude like ne next to and and some of the guys i went to high school with um were enormous um I, I went to high school in an era where for whatever reason kids discovered steroids and so that there were like the, this thing where like they'd come back in the summer and just the be mark mcguire years wasn't enormous it? I um think. yeah i guess uh you know like the high school football team yeah. um in my town all of a sudden just people were freaking enormous yeah, just, um yeah. so so there there was like a i remember you know growing up the entire time um, uh, like I, I always felt small. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so when I got to age 17, I started going to the local gym and lifting weights with my friend. Um, and that was a freaking revelation. Uh, you know, the, the first time I lifted, uh, 135, where it's just one plate on each side. Mm -hmm. It's like That's the a greatest big moment day. Yeah. It's like a, a big, yeah. big, a big moment for any dude. Especially if you're considered skinny or scrawny. Yeah, me, yeah. And, and it was fun, man. Cause I started working out at the gym and then I would just eat, eat, eat anything in sight. I remember. And this is when you're 17? 17, 18. Okay. I worked out consistently from when I was 17 to when I was 30 or so, where maybe I'd take a month off here and there, but I would be in the gym three times a week for those 14 years or so. Good for you. Did your dad work out? No. You learned this from Larry or My friends? dad did Tai Chi. <laughs> okay. Um, which, you know, it's cool. Um, my brother did work out but not like i did i ended up taking it much more seriously i started doing protein shakes too the whole nine like it, it was a good time i'd eat everything in sight right i ate at this place in new york called the pump energy food you ever eat at the pump or what where is it hell's kitchen they had a few locations okay. i think now they're called they, they got superseded by this new chain energy kitchen okay I think I've heard of Energy Kitchen. Yeah, yeah. The um, predecessor was the pump. So you worked out to feel, one, you probably end up liking it over time. You get the endorphins, that sort of thing. But it made you feel like more of a man, more strong. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. More of a man, like more confident. Yeah. Stronger. Uh, yeah, was, those are good times. I will say when you're working out consistently and getting stronger, like you walk down the sidewalk and be like, I can drop to a push-up right now, no problem. Like, you know, like, you know, you're feeling like it's almost 
oddly feeling like you're invincible. But it was born of this chip on my shoulder because yeah. I felt like my masculinity was a question all the time. And Did you wear a lot of muscle shirts or like tighter fitting clothes? Oh, yeah, you of course. Of course. Yeah, Plus, yeah. it was like the 90s, 2000s. That's true. That was you know? part of the game. Yeah. Um, and I, I, my relationship life was still pretty bad. I was going to say, where do the girls fall in here? Yeah. So, so I was always in the gym, like feeling sullen. <laughs> I, I don't know if this happens to other guys, but when you date someone, do you not go to the gym as much? Because that certainly has been my pattern. Yeah, dude, relationship weight. That's a thing. That's a thing? Yeah. So I was single yeah. for most of that time. So that's why I was in the gym all the time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then uh, during the relatively rare instances when I was dating someone, then I'd, I'd ease up. Well, you uh, when you're single, you know, you're going out. There's a chance you, like, go home with a girl or something. So you don't want to be, like, you want to, if, if someone, you never know if someone's going to see you without your shirt off or something like that. You want to be ready. I remember thinking ready. that way, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I'm going to take my shirt off yeah. at a moment's notice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, that's the men, somewhat a mentality, at least before weekends, I guess, if you're, that's, that's, your, that's what you're doing. I, you know, I, I think that this arc, though, that I went through um, was essential to me. In, You've talked about it a good amount. Well, well just, just in, in, depth, the, in the sense that, uh, like, I, I felt bad about myself for most of my youth. Mm. Uh, and, it, and it was, you know, I mean, I was good at school and stuff. And, like, kids that things that other kids valued, like, I didn't value as much. So people were like, oh, wow, you're good at school. It must be great. And, and of course, you're like, yeah, who cares? Right. You know, like, I, you know, I'm like uh, the skinny kid that girls don't like or whatever. Yeah. Um. So, uh, and then that ends up informing your. Uh, professional life and your choices where it's like, oh, I'm not making enough money. Like, oh, I'm a failure. Like, people don't like me. People don't respect me, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like, that, there, there's like a lot of brooding, a lot of gnawing self-doubt, a lot of that stuff. Um, and because of that, I would fuck up just about any relationship that, um, <laughs> like, that started to go anywhere. And I'd mm-hmm. like screw it up very, very quickly because as soon as there was some problem like I, I would get like super down on myself and I like think mm-hmm. the person that, and then I would I would overreact. And this is so this is something we probably should talk about. It's like I would overreact by being like that sort of needy guy who's like, you know, like a little too over eager, like yep. insecure, being like, you know, oh, like, you know, does she like me? And like, what are you? Yeah. Yeah. Or even if she, you know, you know, might have liked me. It's like no one likes that guy. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, women. um Generally, tend to love confidence as as a, a big factor. Um, did you during this time? Did you have like a a vision in your mind of what the man you wanted to be, you know, or what you were striving Always. towards? And well, what was that guy? Well, it, it was like a superhero, man. It was like I want to be, you know, jacked. Mm-hmm. I want to have the hottest some, girl. I want to have some sweet job. I want to like mm-hmm. you know wear something cool. Yeah. I want to, you know, I want to throw a party that's dope mm-hmm. uh, you know whatever it was there was and you know new york lends itself to that sort of thing for sure um but it, it does really put me in mind of and i don't think about this as often as i should especially as a dad um but if you put guys in a situation where they never really um get to a point where they're you know confident they can get a girl confident that uh, you know a girl will like them confident that that someone's going to find them worthwhile Mm -hmm. that stuff is crippling crippling and 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 it's so uh it's such like a massive hurdle you know like the the first time you know like a you know girl agreed to go out with me or whatever it was like like this 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 mass. of course i screwed it up but like you know like like (laughs) there and then when you screw it up like you like you know like get um eaten alive by it for for like a certain period of days maybe days maybe weeks oh yeah uh so there, there's like a there, this is this sense right now I have that so many boys and men are at that point where like they they don't really feel like they have enough to offer, and then because of that, then they're not able to engage in a healthy way, um, especially now because if someone engages in a less than healthy way, then you know it's like uh, punished so badly. Yeah. Um, that I, I feel like a lot of guys will just be like, ah, screw it. Like, I'll just stay at home and, you know, like uh, go online, like play, play, play video games and like do, do things that'll be a little safer. The role model thing to me is so fascinating where that gets seated in you. You know, it's that your pursuit 
of women in its own way was probably framed by your dad's relationship with your mom, right? You saw how he treated her, whether he was happy, whether he was not. Um, you wanted parts of that, all of it, whatever it was. Um, and if you don't have that, somewhat of a role model, model, even if it's not the greatest role model, your dad can be unhappy and maybe bickers with your mom all the time, right? But um, in the absence of that, it's probably worse, right? Um, you know, you're going through that journey alone, you know? I don't know. Well, my, my parents are still together, Yeah. you know? Like, uh, I mean, is it like the most romantic relationship in the world? No. Show me someone in their like 60s, 70s, 80s where it's just like rainbows and butterflies. Yeah, but know? They, you know, they're still <laughs> companions. Yeah. A and I always appreciated the heck out of my dad as like a kind of strong provider type. Yeah. I'm a very different dad than he, though, you know, what, what, what is one thing that does happen to us? We all become our dads very, very quickly. Yeah. I don't know if that is, I mean, you know, you I haven't read about yet. that yet, but everybody, I've always felt that like there's my dad, quick aside, my daddy. So anytime like things were expensive or like that's like the nickel and dime you, he would always say he'd go, oh, I got to pay for that. I'd be like, ka-ching, ka-ching, like a cash register. And then like, it was, I was like 25. 26 and I found myself like someone at like ping me for money and I was like ka-ching ka-ching oh my god <laughs> turning into my father but that and I guess that happens right <laughs> yeah I so my my parents you know immigrants and so uh, money always was a thing yeah and there was a long period when my mom would guilt trip me and my brother about all the money that was being spent on us whatever on, for whatever your mother would my mother would okay um, my, though my mother was incredible. She was like so loving and yeah. like, uh, you know, like always, um, she's still sacrificing. So loving. Yeah. She's, she's still uh, amazing the best, but she would talk about the money a lot. Not, and then one time sure you're not spoiled yeah. in my, no, in my teens, I was like, Hey mom, tell you what, like you can keep track of every penny you spend on me and I'll give it back to you uh, at the end with interest. And then you can just not deal with me anymore. How's that for a deal? And then, <laughs> and then she, <laughs> And then because I was tired of getting guilt tripped, I yeah. was like, well, you know, just like if you're going to do it, like, you know, yeah. do it. Right. But don't like you make me gold. feel like shit about it all the time. Right. And then she was like, Andy, you're so mean. Like, why would you say that? To me? And I was oh. like, I mean, you know, it's like well, it I was, mean, kids are mean to their parents. It's yeah, I know. So, you know, my, my mom's incredible. Yeah. I, I really would look at my brother as like my main role model in my adolescence. And then yeah. my dad is like just like kind of a strong um, pro Steady, pro sounds. provider figure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember one time there was like a stray dog that was like messing with um, me and my, my brother and was like looking to bite us and we were scared. We were very young. Mm -hmm. And then my dad came running like a bat out of hell and like he was like a bear. Really? You know, he'd like morphed into like form of a grizzly bear or whatever, just run, runs down that yard screaming at the top as long as that dog just freaking takes off. Like my, my dad scared the shit out of me and my brother. Just generally, yeah. I mean, my dad grew up on a farm in Taiwan, so he always had this farmer vibe. Mm. And he he would do weird shit where, like, a a deer hit his car or vice versa. It looked like the deer hit his car because the door had caved in. Um, and so he then took the deer, threw it on top of the car, and then drove it to a butcher, and then came back and got all these bloody hunks of venison. And I was like, what the heck's all <laughs> this stuff in there? <laughs> Your dad sounds like a badass man. My 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 dad is a very very strong willed soul. Yeah. And I think I got a sense of because, you know, part of part of the pressure I, I felt was like my dad went from a farm in Taiwan to labs in, of IBM and GE and yeah. the suburbs of New York in one generation. So I was like, OK, I started you out in the suburbs. That. You got to outdo your father, right? That's yeah. So like, how do I go? You know, how do I compare to that leap? That's tough, man. <laughs> Maybe you run for president. You got to run for president. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I did feel like my parents just sacrificed so much for me and my brother. And I was like, why, why did you do this? And it must be because we could do something important or significant. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that's interesting is like people in the Asian community a lot, which is like, how, why, how the heck did you get the inspiration to do what you've done? Because it just does not compute. Mm. It doesn't make sense from our community that someone would just be like, Hey, I think I can run for president of the United States. Uh, there were a lot of folks that just found it literally impossible that someone could just, do that and thanks to you really man and like a lot of people listening to this um that uh you know that we made something really special happen right uh and my parents were not excited about the campaign when i first told them about mm -hmm. it uh they were concerned they were concerned about my family my safety my um you know money <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Um, and so it, it turned around, but it, it was because I felt like my parents had imbued the sense of possibility in me. And, and uh, it, it's interesting thinking about this because I feel like I'm an unlikely spokesperson for American masculinity in some ways. Yeah. Um, but the, one of the things that informed our campaign, a lot of other things we, we do is like we say, okay, there's a problem, I can solve it. I think I can make a contribution. Let's head in that direction. Let's try and get people to see it, mm -hmm. to be energized by it uh, and, and the rest of it. And there, there's a lot of optimism you need for that, a lot of uh, confidence, a lot of a sense of potential. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it means that I'm, you know, I've got some uh, deficiencies on the other side. Um, <laughs> yeah, know, man. Every strength in excess is a weakness. Yeah, right? you know, uh, but, but it, it was... It was one of, when we were running for president, I said to myself, if I do everything right, we can do something very special. If I do everything right for two and a half years, mm -hmm. um, did I do everything right? Of course mm -hmm. not. I mean, you know, there were some Me issues either. along the way. But but like I, I just thought, you know, I, that the average day of campaigning for president, there were, you know, like 200 micro decisions that had to be made. And, you know, we made a lot of those micro decisions like, you know, moderately effectively. Yeah. Um, but there's there's like a... There have been people who've said to me, particularly men, um, where where they said that you know our campaign made them feel like more more is possible. Particularly people who are from immigrant communities, they would say like, "Wow, like you made me think that I can do more." Yeah, um, and, and that's something I was really proud of. I mean, I know because of the fan mail and things we received, where our campaign affected men a lot and brought them out of their shell and made them had gave them a purpose and gave them in some ways an explanation for what's happening too and i want to do that yeah. again Probably the last question on this, but do you think your dad had this outsized success, right? From like peanut farm in Taiwan to, you know, senior at GE, wherever, but, you know, college educated in America, right? Did you think in order to, did you have any, like in the back of your mind, was it some of the decisions you went the traditional path and then you got right off it, right? You did yeah. the whole like college, like you were prep school, college, law school, then like startup, <laughs> like tech company, nonprofit, run for president. Um, did you feel that in order to keep up maybe with what your dad did, you had to buck the trend, you had to get off the beaten path? Or was that- Well, my parents were very upset when I left the law. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was with Most you in the are. sense that I, I met a startup CEO, uh, his name was Mark Jacobstein. And I just thought to myself, this dude, like, I want to do whatever he's doing, mm. you know, like I, I bet a lot of people listening to this might have met someone who had made that impression on them where it's mm -hmm. like maybe like in my case it was a startup CEO. And I was like, whatever he's doing, yeah, I have to try I and like figure this out vibe. a way to, yeah. Yeah, I have to try and figure out a way to do that. And, and I, I did feel some pressure to try and uh, what I what I said to them and myself, I was like, look, I grew up in the suburbs of New York. Uh, you know, I was a miserable attorney for those five months. Um, and I was like, is my purpose just to like reproduce and like return to the suburbs from once I came? Am I just like a salmon? Mm. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> like that doesn't seem right. Like yeah. I should take a swing at doing something really significant and mm -hmm. try and level up. Mm -hmm. And then that didn't work. And then it was like very, very distressing when my first company failed and the second company ran out of money and all this stuff. Um, you know, that, that defined my 20s. Did you talk to your dad when the companies had failed? I would never talk to my dad about any of that stuff. Are you kidding? <laughs> never. <laughs> my dad, I would go home, you know, occasionally and just like grunt at me. And then, you know, like, it, it's like, you know. That's the kind of I'm curious about is like if you get, then something you guys talked about a lot of your ambitions or masculinity or things like that. Were you able to talk to your brother about it or did you just learn it naturally by watching him? Both my brother and I had this kind of like chip on our shoulder it's manifest in different ways my brother's an academic which mm. by the way is the hardest fucking job i've ever seen yeah it's a hard job um <laughs> so, you know, i thought it was a lot easier now it's not um um so uh but we didn't really talk to my dad about that stuff and one thing that happened to my dad and may be happening to me we shall see uh is my dad when i was in my adolescence was really mad he was an angry mm -hmm. dude honestly and and he was angry in part because 
he felt like he'd been passed over for any management jobs mm -hmm. at IBM. Um, and what he said was, when you can't invent anything anymore, they make you a manager. So it's all white managers and all Asian right. engineers. Now, the truth is, my dad would have been a lousy fucking manager. I mean, he's like, you know, he's like the last person you would put in charge of another human being. That's not really his forte. Got it. Um, but he was pissed off and bitter about it. Yeah. Uh, and then after I left the house, my brother left the house. My dad actually went back to Taiwan to work as an executive where they recruited him out of the lab at IBM and said, no, we're mm -hmm. gonna put you in charge of this department. That company ended up not doing very well and then he went from there to academia. But he has chilled out so much more in his older age. Like he went from being very, very angry to being more happy-go-lucky jolly. Okay. Uh, and I seem to be making that progression <laughs> okay. like, like i was so mad in my 20s and e even when i started the presidential run i was mad you know I'm, I'm not angry in the same way now that i was um and part of it is when you have a family and kids like you, you know uh you you don't want that same energy i don't think uh, or it might just be that i'm mellowing out you know maybe um there is a dad brain there's like a different chemical releases when you have a, a child um, and it makes it's less testosterone and more estrogen, frankly. Um, it's like the long and short. Yeah, of keep it. you around, keep you from straying. For sure. Um, and makes you like you release certain hormones and things when you hold a, um, a child and the child absorbs them or, or feels that energy and things like that. Um, but it's interesting to me how, um, frankly, what you remember about your dad and what the, the thing that is where I'm getting to what we need to discuss over time is like helping men find their purpose and find learn how they find and understand their purpose. Because when they don't, that's when you have a lot of um, the, the stats I'm, I'm sharing and a lot of fathers, even if they're unwillingly doing it, they, they help show their sons what their purpose is and how they can fill that. And we need to evolve that definition for men today because the opportunities are different. And that's... Um, probably where we're at, you know, as a country. Well, one thing I do forecast mm -hmm. ahead for many, many men is I think they're going to find uh, community in gaming. Uh, and then that's going to morph into uh, Web3, NFTs, yes. like, like uh, DAOs and different types of online communities. Uh, I think that's the way it's going to head for a lot of men. I agree. It's already heading there. And I think that the challenge is making that community positive, positive, strong, yeah. healthy and whole. Um, and not doing what we did last time, which is like building these worlds without keeping the, the concept of men's purpose in mind and women's purpose, like both. Um, and, and you'd like to have uh, a bit more of a hybrid where it's online, offline too. Yes, URL and IRL. Because um, one, it seems like uh, the extreme, particularly URL can be a disaster, um, can be, but you know, the wrong IRL experience is bad, just as bad in some ways. So. Um, I'm gonna be. I'm. I'm not done down my rabbit hole. That's for sure. Oh um, yeah, no, this rabbit hole is very deep, and very I, you deep. know, I don't. I don't think we've uh, solved for American masculinity just no, yet. No, but if you all have suggestions, um, the single biggest thing I'm going to say to anyone listening to this who's struggling in this dimension mm -hmm. uh, is to exercise, preferably outdoors, uh, multiple times a week. Like you can have the shittiest, lousiest day in the world. I had so many shitty, lousy days in my twenties. Mm -hmm. I still have them. Yep. And, but if you get some exercise in, then you will always know that you did something that day that you can be proud of, that's good for you. You just feel so much better. Just, like, just you know, if you're listening to this and you know, you're struggling at all, just force yourself to do some form of exercise, preferably outdoors. Uh, you know, like, like when, when I have these kinds of days, I will just run and it, it's not like a good run either. It's like an embarrassing <laughs> run, you know, yeah. like, but, but just run it to a point where you're uh, sucking wind and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and studies have shown that that stuff makes you feel a lot better. It eases loneliness and depression to some extent. You'll feel better about yourself um, and it's healthier. I a thousand percent agree. I would recommend, look, if you can afford it, getting a, a workout classes or I used to, if you live in New York, there's something called class pass. I think used to exist um, or a Peloton or, but even if like, if you're like money's tight, there's YouTube channels that have somewhere where you just play and there's a trainer on there for 20 minutes, 30 minutes and have to me, like it's hard to stay motivated like that, but I'll get up and like press play. And then like, I just like 
work me, dude, or gal, whoever the instructor is. Just I'm just doing push-ups or burpees, whatever it is. And I know if I just like get through this 20 minutes, I'm going to feel good about myself. You yes. Know? Um, and I did and, it this morning. This and if it. you have it available to you, go to a gym. Like go yes. to a gym with your friend. I, a gym. Yeah. Like I, I went to a gym randomly. This is a number of years ago. But I saw these two dudes in there working out. They must have been like 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of when I first went to the gym with yeah. my friend. Andy George, uh, who is my, you know, yeah. my, my high school buddy, um, like just having a dude go with you to the gym, if you're living in a place where that's a thing, uh, it's, you know, like, a, you'll have a harder workout than if it was by yourself for sure. A thousand percent. Yeah. You'll go, you'll reinforce each other. You'll both feel good about yourselves. So, so that's, that's a very elevated thing, but, uh, you know, if, if you can't go to a gym with a friend, just try and get a sweat in somehow. Yes. Amen. Um, all right, folks, more to come. Good episode. We'll see you next week. Oh, um, thank you for playing therapist and having me unpack oh, my development fun, as the strapping man <laughs> you see before you. Uh, you know, I, I think about it a lot as the father of two boys, and mm -hmm. like my my boys, my boys are growing up so differently than I did and my brother did. Mm -hmm. It's a different time. I tell myself that all the time. I I, I think about it a lot. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Am I concerned about it too? Yes. Am I like concerned about? you know, things that I could be doing better, like also, yes. But, you know, from what you've cited, apparently just the fact that I'm around a dad is going to be kind of a big win. Biggest takeaway from that book is like, what's the what's needed to be a good dad to help your son in particular? Show up. Show up. Is it be around? Love them. That's good advice for a lot of things. Show That's up. That's true. What is it? What do you... Or at least in this case, virtually, it'd be like, success. show up virtually. Yeah, show up virtually. <laughs> Log in. <laughs> That's our show, folks. See you next week.